Good morning, everybody. I'm Steele Marku, Editor-in-Chief of Veranda Magazine, and I am thrilled to be back with you today for day two of Discover ADAC. Today, I'm joined by my dear friend, interior designer Amanda Lindroth, for what will be, I know, a really great conversation about her inspiring life and career. I'm so thrilled to have the chance to speak with her today and to share that conversation with all of you. But before I introduce Amanda to you, I'd like to give a, a warm welcome to everyone and a huge thanks to our host, ADAC, as well as our sponsor, Tebow. Tebow is one of our favorite design firms at Veranda. We love incorporating their uh, papers and fabrics and textiles into all of our own projects. And they have a beautiful new showroom at ADAC that I encourage all of you to visit when you have the chance to do so. And now we're gonna hear a brief message from Tebow. Thank you so much to Tebow, and I hope you all enjoyed that very uplifting and um, cheerful video from them. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen now with everyone and bring on and introduce Amanda. Based, Amanda Lindroth is based in the Bahamas, where she is joining us from today, and she's also a Florida native, and all of her projects have this kind of breezy, sophisticated style. You might almost think it's part of her DNA. Um, as I said, you can see it in all of her decorating projects from Lyford Key to Maine. And you can also get a little taste of her style brought to you in your very own home, thanks to her line of incredibly beautiful tabletop accessories and recently added wicker furniture items. You can find everything in her shops in Palm Beach and in Charleston or online at amandalindroth.com. And last but not least, Amanda is also, also the author of this great book. I have to hold it in front of me <laughs> so you can see it, called Island Hopping. Here, I'll hold it in front of my face so you can actually see the whole cover. Um, her, Amanda's book is such a great read. It's really, really a fun way to get to know her um, beyond just the way you'll get to know her in our conversation today. Before I get started with Amanda, though, I'd like to remind everyone that we will be taking questions from the audience, and you can submit those questions to me via the Q&A function through Zoom. So without further ado, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us for Discover ADAC today from the Bahamas. It's so nice oh, to see you. Can you see me? We can see you. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm so kisses to you, Steele, because as you Hi. said in the intro, we've been trying to do this for so long. And I'm so excited to be here with you. And, and a reason to get dressed and do even blow out my hair. Every I know. Season. I know. I think this may be the most dressed up I've been in, in six months, <laughs> truly. <laughs> so, I mean, um, as a sidebar, I forgot to tell everyone, including all the tech people, this. Um, because I'm in the Bahamas and I've been doing Zoom a lot lately, every once in a while we lose the internet for six, <laughs> 45 seconds or 60 seconds. So if we go blank here, I don't know what you'll do, Steele. You might have to juggle or do some card tricks or something, but I'll be back. If don't worry. You. The ADAC, the ADAC audience is used to seeing me juggle after yesterday. We had some um, lots of excitement, dogs barking, internet outages. It's all good. We'll we'll good. keep things rolling. <laughs> and as I mentioned, that we had a coconut tree here, a big beautiful Jamaica tall coconut. The ones you really, the ones we worship, um, the pretty wooden oh. ones, get hit by lightning, and so oh, no. some men are. 
squirming up at trying to cut it down. And Danny's asked them not to make any noise, but you never know. So we'll, we'll hope that that doesn't happen. A coconut, a coconut surgery happening in, in a coconut yard. Surgery. <laughs> well, honestly, that is the beauty of doing all of these conversations from home is that we all have to kind of roll with the punches, go with the flow a little bit more. Yes, exactly. And you know what? That's just part of life in 2020. <laughs> there we go. 2020. It's our year. It's oh. Okay, I'm going to get started with our slides. And my first question for you, which is, you know, you grew up in Florida. Um, I won't say the decade, but, you know, it was your, your upbringing happened in the 20th century. And how did your, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how your family got to Florida and a little bit about how it, growing up in Florida during that time period has influenced you and your style. Well, um, it's so funny um, that you ask. I, I talk about my mother endlessly, and I think anyone who's heard me speak before is probably bored by this topic, but I had this incredibly chic mother. She was just innately, <laughs> um, innately sort of, think of sort of Candace Bergen or, oh. or Kate Moss. She was thin like Kate Moss, which has always been a challenge because uh, I didn't, God didn't make me that way. Yeah, that's um, but in any case, um, she was sort of like rake thin, and, um, and she was sort of a, a style icon um, of her sort of, sort of set, if that makes sense. And, um, and her, my, my parents met, um, they were both from Philadelphia. My mother was working in New York and, um, and she had this sort of, sort of um, she had been to Italy in, it, for junior year abroad and sort of had this sort of sense of the fact that um, that, that style of the Italian and the, and, the, and the European style was very interesting. And my father was bona fide American. He <laughs> and he, and he, he was sort of very, um, a sort of a preppy American. And, oh, and um, What he, a combo. Yeah, they moved. My mother said that my father moved her to Florida on their honeymoon and never let her go back north. And she sort of, that was sort of a, um, a sort of a whine throughout our entire childhood. It was sort of, I didn't really know what it meant, but my mother felt that she'd been sort of abandoned in Florida. Um, <laughs> in any case, um, they moved to Boca Raton, Florida in 1963. And Boca Raton is this, this beautiful um, 1920s uh, the Boca Raton Hotel was built by Meisner, who was really the creator of what we think of Palm Beach being. Um, uh, he, he arrived in Palm Beach in, I don't know, about 1910 and brought this Mediterranean revival style of architecture there and built all of the big gigantic mansions for, um, for the rich of that era. Um, and then he set his eyes on Boca a few years later as a sort of get rich quick kind of scheme, um, maybe, that's, maybe that's being too rude, but in any <laughs> case, um, he built this beautiful hotel called The Cloister, and, and The Cloister had the duo of the 1929 hurricane and the stock market crash, and oh, we've got the dog and the tree trimmers right now going. <laughs> um, uh, and so The Cloister ended up in a kind of financial mess, and the town was in a mess, but the but the building was very, very beautiful. And I grew up around the corner from it. My mother um, and, and father bought um, these uh, pretty, uh, we had built two beautiful modern houses, which I, I laugh about because my, my whole architectural ethos is about old things. And I grew up in this house. Um, Amazing. My, mother's, my mother said to, to us when we were children, uh, that your father, we weren't rich enough to live in a mansion in Palm Beach and she wasn't going to live in a terrible ranch style house of Florida. <laughs> So the architecture of Florida in the 60s was really, I mean, it was pretty poor. Um, it was not um, very sexy. And she found this tall, um, glamorous Danish architect called Paul Robin John. He's had this beautiful name and he was, he had floppy blonde hair. I'll never forget him. He was about six foot six and bright blue eyes. And he built two houses for our family, a tiny one um, in, in one part of Boca Raton when we were little. And then as my parents had more and more children, we were four children in all, um, they built this bigger house, um, which had 11 flat roofs, all of which leaked. Wow. And, um, and so I grew up in this real modernist, modernist kind of um, house with a mother who really had a very pared down. I always think of like a Kate Moss look because she kind of looked like that. She was sort of flat chested with broad shoulders in a white button down shirt open to her navel with a long set of pearls and a cigarette. Lots of smoking. Oh my God. <laughs> can, I, it's like I can feel the Italian influence though. It's yeah, so yeah. chic. Yeah, and she would say, don't be ridiculous. And Don't she would say, 
you know, she was, you know, she had a, her, her idea of parenting was all about love, but it was sort of very um, sort of 60s and 70s. I, I don't know, it's hard to describe, but uh, the house actually represents a lot about what she was like. <laughs> sort and of hard, what, hard corners. <laughs> because, well, right, there's some straight lines here, but, um, you know, this house is not what I would necessarily, this house, if you say Palm Beach, this is not what I immediately see. And right. yet there is this strong thread of kind of mid-century influence in Palm Beach. Is there, am I right about that? Yeah, I mean, I, so I was actually raised in Boca Raton, which is fully 30 right. minutes right. south right. of uh, Palm Beach, but we had a very Palm Beachy kind of influence because there wasn't any shopping in Boca at the time. And my mother loved to walk, wander up and down Worth Avenue in our childhood. We were sort of, we were up there looking around and shopping a bit and, um, and, and uh, my parents would take us as little girls to lunch at the Petite Marmite, which was this incredible restaurant on Worth Avenue. Um, and here's Palm Beach of my childhood. I, the I picture it. on the left is not, I, I, the cars are too old to be in my childhood. I'm not that old. <laughs> I've never updated the presentation with one which has 60s cars. I think these are more 50s cars. But this is Worth Avenue, true and true. It looks exactly the same today as it did then, which is uh, one of the great um, blessings of our lives is that um, the town of Palm Beach has been so rigid about um, the continuity of keeping this beautiful, um, this perfect uh, street um, preserved and wonderful. Um, and you can imagine as a little kid walking up and down and we would go to the lullaby shop and the prep shop and I we bought it. our first, uh, the Jack Rogers shoes were invented um, in Palm Beach um, and we would buy them um, from the lullaby shop as little girls and then at Kornhauser's, which was just was a shoe emporium. I love and of course, it. The women of Palm Beach were glamorous and 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 beautiful. It was a real time for for young eyes to to learn. Um, it had a huge influence on me. The picture on the right, of course, is that iconic Slim Aaron's picture of all the ladies in Lily Pulitzer. And in those days, we knew Lily Pulitzer because oh. she was. She was, we had a shop in Boca Raton, we had a shop, there was a, there were shops all over, and she, she was just starting that business. And I can actually still remember the, the prints actually, the, the fabrics actually had a particular smell to them because of it. the way they were made. And you'd walk into the shop and it was full of colorful, they had a whole bank of colorful ribbons and they would tie your, your package in a cellophane bag with the color ribbon of the fabrics. It was like a grow grain. Yes, it was a magical place, magical place. I, can, I, I mean, think I can, I can sort of recreate that smell myself. <laughs> isn't that funny? Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, it was really something. Uh, and my, my father had a really vulgar Lily Pulitzer green and white jacket, uh, uh, blazer with crabs all over it. And I feel <laughs> like it made its way to every one of my siblings' college campuses for costume parties and, and silly That's things. So I don't know who ended up with it, but anyway, I, I think about that crazy jacket. We all wore it. it. Yeah. Um, I, I'm wondering, you know, with this kind of, as you said, like it's such a rich kind of style upbringing for young eyes to be just kind of soaking it in. Yeah. Are there certain hallmarks of Florida style that you feel like you still rely on or, or look to yes. today in your work? A hundred percent. Um, so this bit, this slide that you've got on the screen right now is the beautiful, beautiful, um, it's a folly of a building at Vizcaya. And I, I often like completely dream about the creation of Vizcaya because while Meisner was building all of those houses in Palm Beach, um, John Deering, who had been the, he was the heir to the John Deere tractor fortune, mm -hmm. um, went out in, I think in 1916, I, I'm, someone could correct me, um, and bought this tranche of land in Miami, which if you can imagine, Flagler's Railroad had barely gotten there. So All the way Miami, down there, yeah. Yeah, Miami was really, um, it was serious like uncharted territory in that era. And he went to Miami to build what I think is maybe the most beautiful, certainly the most beautiful house in Florida, but mm. one of the most beautiful houses in America because of its scale. Um, mm. And if anybody who's, who's, anyone who has not seen it, you need to go see it because um, it, it, it has an enormous effect on, um, on you because it's, it's just, there's a tranquility about its, its sense of place. It's in a, in a very, very, um, very natural environment. So it's very, un it's, un it's unkept in a way, in a weird way, it's mangrovey and, and so beautiful. And I find this particular building 
um, one of the prettiest things I've ever seen. And so, yes, I, I mean, as a threat to my, my sort of my eye being evolved, I really did um, wander around Florida in my teens, in my Cutlass, my 1973, my, I got a hand-me-down car from my mother, um, <laughs> it's a 1973 Cutlass convertible, which is in this, which is like a huge big car in this day and age. And we, we, I literally drove around South Florida many times in my, in my, chi in my teens, looking at architecture, looking at the great architecture of Miami, all the Art Deco stuff, which had not been really um, restored when I was mm. 17, 18 years old. Yet those, that whole Miami Beach thing was still um, a retirement home, actually. Um, it, it had a renaissance just as I was going to college. And then the latter architecture, which was more, even more fanciful, which was all the sort of uh, Morris Lapidus stuff, the Fountain Blue Hilton, and then the things going oh, yes. into Hollywood were these crazy Art Deco hotels. Because in that day and age, the, when the highway was, the railroad came to, to Miami and then the highway was built, Northerners came to Florida for extended holidays, one month, two months. And so that era, of, that was a very prosperous time um, post-war in that part of Florida. So there's tons of, there are just tons of quirky and amazing things to look at. Um, this slide that's on the, on the um, screen now is Kaliza, which is a house that Orion and I built in 2005. It took two and a half years to build. It took about two years to draw. And because my husband and I are such scholars of architecture and, um, and, and classicism, um, we were fortunate enough to uh, have Maria de la Guardia and Teofilo Victoria, our architects, and us collaborate um, to build this incredibly beautiful house here in Nassau um, in, in Coral Stone. I think there's another slide of it somewhere, which we'll get to. Um, and uh, there it is. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, that's the view from the beach. It looks very imposing there. It's actually quite a tidy house. It's 52 feet by 52 feet. It's a perfect cube. Um, and um, it's funny because I always say to Maria, why do I feel better when I'm in a house that you've designed? And she always says, well, because it's not arbitrary, it's math, it's classicism. The rules are the rules, and uh, if you follow them, the volumes of spaces that you're in actually do feel better. It's very strange, and I'm, I'm sure some of you have walked into classical libraries or classical um, federal buildings that have been done very impeccably, and it's weird. You do actually get a sense of well-being in these spaces, um, and I and it's and it's it's sort of foolproof and so um you know when in architecture as a grown-up now i always um, recommend to my clients to use the very best architects because it really does matter and it costs the same frankly in fact it, it could cost more if you go if you make a mistake <laughs> yeah. and this is the Kaliza. this is the brand of looking over the sea um and this um it's a very beautiful uh very very beautiful house um award um, which is one of the classical architecture awards well the, and and we'll we'll come back to this house at the end of our conversation because there's i hope we'll get to hear there's kind of a funny story that's been going on with that house recently exactly this, so this, this, is, sorry, this is your current home in the bahamas yeah. and this is where i am right this minute um, I love uh, this is hope hill and i i always need to be changing these photographs because um this house actually this picture actually on the left does show the house very beautifully because uh, it had just been through a hurricane and there's a very sort of a, a tree that's hanging on for dear life in the, in the <laughs> right hand side, uh, but you can see very much um, the house. So this house was also um, designed by a classical architect called Henry Mellick who worked here in um, Lyford Key and in Nassau from the 50s until the 90s. Um, and he built a huge number of wonderful classical um, winter residence homes. This one was built for a great lady called Hopi Simpson, thus the name Hope Hill, and I it's on it. a cliff. Um, and we, we took the house um, and, and sort of took it down to its bones and um, added all the folly. So in other words, she built the house in about 1980 <clears throat> here in Nassau, which was a, wow. a funny time, it, the country was, just coming out of independence and um and it had metal railings and sliding doors and sort of all kinds of quirky things that were perfect for someone who was having two months a year in the house but for right. us we're going to live here for 12 months a year we wanted a little more um a little more uh classical stability like a little more nuance so we we took the um inspiration from um from oliver messel who was the set designer who ended up doing 
all that wonderful architecture in Barbados and Mystique. Um, and this green is known as Nestle Green in those environs. And um, we have, um, we, it's Benjamin Moore Southfield Green for anyone who's interested. Um, and all of those quirky railings. And, and um, I asked Maria, my guru, my classical guru, why the Nestle houses are fun. And he, she said, well, he knew just enough about architecture. And then the rest of it <laughs> through the kitchen sink hat. And, and therefore, they have so much joy. There's a lot of joy and silliness um, in his like there are railings that wiggle and there are scallops on some um, shed awnings and things. Um, and, and so uh, it's quite joyful. And so that this is our current house and it's the perfect house for us actually. It overlooks the golfer. This is the terrace at Hope Hill. I have since painted all of that rattan green because it got too grubby. And, I love um, it. and um, it looks kind of charming. Um, and uh, the terrace is only 10 feet wide and that, is obviously tr problematic for doors swinging. So <laughs> you can see it in a pinch that we're in that opening that we have bifolding French doors that fold into the to the drawing room into the living room. Uh, yeah. And so therefore the porch you get the full breadth of it. Um, it's quite wonderful because it is intimate. I, I feel like um, it's so funny and decorating, but sometimes smaller spaces are cozier and mm. and give you a better sense of being uh, of well being. And so. This is really um, the DNA of, of my brand is pretty much what happens on this porch, on this veranda. Um, well, we entertain, we eat here. We don't have a dining room. So even in hot months, we're sitting out in this octagon having sweaty meals, I guess. <laughs> I love it. I mean, speaking of that, I feel like there's, that's such a great segue to my next question for you, which is really more of an observation, but it almost feels like your houses are on vacation themselves, even if they're not actually vacation houses. There's just such an air of ease and kind of laid back, good, comfortable living. And I'm just kind of, like I said, it's maybe more of an observation than even a question, but is that something that you are actively pursuing? And if so, kind of what goes into that? What, what creates that vibe? Um, you know, still, I, I really don't like um, being sad, being worried and being, um, frantic. I think that your house needs to be a place where, um, where you feel joy and yeah. where you feel um, that you're, uh, I think there's a general well-being. And to do that, sometimes, I mean, I'm no, I'm no psychiatrist, I'm no shrink, so I don't really know about all the deep stuff. But what I do <laughs> know is if you open your doors and you get fresh air and you keep things that are living in your house, like always have some plants or some leaves. We don't have we can't get fresh flowers in the Bahamas readily, easily, or affordably. So we go out <laughs> in our gardens every week and chop down a palm frond or a bougainvillea if, if there is something like that, or some gardenias or something that's living. Get that in your house. Get the doors open, for crying out loud. Put yes. some music on, and you will always feel well. It's a very funny thing because my young daughter, who's 15 this weekend, used to say on the rarest of occasions, she would come home from school in, in Life or Key and no one had opened the doors or the lights weren't on. And she said, mommy, mommy, I don't like to come home to this. And I said, isn't that funny? Because as a sort of a, a rule, our house is always wide open. I love um, and it does feel better. You know what I mean? It does. It, it feels better. You know, you mentioned going down and chopping things down and bringing them inside. And I just, I have to mention, I learned that lesson from a, a mutual, two mutual friends of ours, Elizabeth Beeler, Liz Strong, and right. Heather Jack. I just had to throw that out there, but I, I have scaled trees or watched Beeler scale yeah. trees. And <laughs> that, if Liz yeah. Strong, if Liz Beeler, Liz Strong, who's your closest BFF, if she's <laughs> listening, she, she's, the, she's the gold standard of creating yeah. a room that just sizzles with joy and life and goodness. I hope you're hearing that, Liz. I know, if not, we'll be We'll pass it on to her. Um, you know, you talk about sort of open doors and bringing in the life, which is obviously happening in this room. And this is just one example, but there's something else. I mean, there's your sense of color. There's a joyful approach to pattern. Um, I wonder if you can speak to some of, some of that, how, you know, how that sort of ups the, um, that same, you know, laid back vibe um, well, in your projects. I tend to use a huge amount of quadrille and China Seas fabrics. Um, I love them. and um, the owners of, of that company, John and John, are my great greatest friends, um, and they are just so fresh. I mean, I think that 
the other thing about um, about interiors is they have to be fresh and clean. They don't need to be expensive. Um, and I will say this about print and color is that it had to, it was a, a, a skill I had to acquire. Mm. It, my, my, our, my mother's houses were all in white cotton duck, everything, <laughs> everywhere. And so when I first started decorating, I used white cotton duck and I used seersucker from the, from the local Nassau, the shop where you buy fabrics to sew clothes with. Um, and that was as brave as I got. And so learning to use color and prints um, was something I had to learn. Um, and I'm still probably, it's the thing I do last in decorating. I do all the oh, scale first, um, and then I finally tiptoe around the patterns and the things, which is really funny because I often see people scheming. The first thing they do is they go to the fabrics, um, but I have to get the furniture layout done first and put the scale in the room and understand how the walls and the ceiling and the floors will go. And then I tiptoe around the, around the prints and the color. I think that's so interesting because, I mean, I am not a decorator and I am, I'm exposed to great fabric and pattern all the time. And so I'll, I'll get something in my head and go like, this is it. Like I'm doing, I want my whole living room around this, you know, but, but you, you kind of thinking about scale and balance first. I mean, I, you, you, one current that you've brought up several times in our conversation already is this notion of well-being. And I think that scale and proportion really, you know, if you get that right, that's so much more important in terms of creating that sense of well-being in a room. That's just, well, that's I, I, I think it probably goes back to, again, the, um, the innate sense of um, architecture that starts, that, that's important to me. So I think we start with the bones of the room, and then we figure out the furniture and the scale, because you always need something tall in the middle, and something dropping down, da, 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 da. there's so many little <laughs> things that are um, unconsciously on your mind when you're doing that. Um, but the fabrics, I really, truly, I'm almost like, Ooh, okay, we got, we got to tackle those fabrics. Um, now it's time for that. Yeah. You know, something else, and this image is um, calling this up for me, but I also feel like there's such a great air of nostalgia, a little bit. And I mean, your rooms are very contemporary and current and forward thinking and all of those great attributes as well. But there's this really kind of comforting notion of nostalgia. For me, when I look at this image, I see it in the paneling. Um, well, but I wondered if you could speak a little bit to designing with that um, nostalgia. Well, it's insane that you brought that up exactly, that nostalgia thing, because this room was our client, our beloved magical clients in Palm Beach. Um, so her, she grew up going to her grandmother's house in Palm Beach. And her grandmother was a grand dame of the highest order and lived in a very important house in Palm Beach. And her favorite room where her childhood memories were really made was this um, paneled, this Pecky Cypress oh, wow. uh, paneled room. And it was done in these vertical boards that are, um, I think you call them, when you do it, uh, varied widths. And, um, and yeah. so she asked us to recreate that room for her. Okay. And unlike many other projects, we use Pecky a lot. But in this instance, we actually did all the casework in Pecky. So the rims are Pecky. And even the mullion bars are painted to match the um, paneling. Uh, and, and, and it was really, it's really pretty. It's so pretty. This is a brand new house. Um, the clients are fantastic. And um, they built themselves a one bedroom house adjacent to their old house, which they are sort of letting the, their grown children uh, take over. Um, and our, uh, the, the great Aldous Bertram who works for me painted those sweet watercolors, which bifold back, um, there's a television. Uh, oh, how <laughs> clever. And even the pecky frame. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. I love it. Speaking, yeah. Oh, oh, I, I forgot about this slide. Uh, sorry, I thought I was going to another that's, Aldous image. That's okay. This is their bedroom, which is very oh. serene, um, uh, very, very, very serene and old fashioned. They're very old fashioned um, and sort of magical. And they can go outside that door and tiptoe across and check on their teenage and 20 year old children um, oh. across the way. Yeah. <laughs> And that wicker chaise, I mean, again, with the nostalgia, it's like, ugh, I could just curl up there. Right, it's a vintage something we found. Um, yeah, it's a very pretty bed, very feminine and pretty and airy, I think. It's really airy, it's beautiful. Yeah. The bed is stunning. Thank you. This is where I thought I was going. So again, to that kind of sense yeah. of whimsy, because that, I, you know, and maybe it's, maybe it's a little bit of messel influence, but your projects yeah. all have a great deal of whimsy that is so joyful and, and so uplifting. Well, this was actually an, our apartment in Palm Beach. Um, and because it was our apartment, the whimsy got 
amped up, you know, <laughs> whimsy on steroids, I think. I so I said to Aldous, would you paint my apartment? And he said, yes. And he showed up in Palm Beach. He's like, well, you didn't tell me it was 18 feet tall. And I said, get on with it. And we bought some scaffolding and there he was dangling off the scaffolding for like about four months. I and the, the inspiration was the Cecil Beaton um, watercolor of Mrs. Harrison Williams, who became, um, oh God, she became, she was married five times. So she had many, she was glory, uh, she was, mm, I can't remember her next one, but it's but Alzheimer's moment. Anyway, um, and she had, there was a portrait of her in her Palm Beach house, and she's in either yellow or red trousers on a red or yellow sofa, can't remember, with her chinoiserie wallpaper. Um, and, and she just looks tall and lean and thin. And I said to him, here's your inspiration, get on with it. And, um, and he painted this completely mad, crazy, um, silly uh, sort of idea of our version of that, including this wonderful overdoor on the right hand side. Um, I guess the most famous plaster work in the world is at Claydon House outside of London, um, an 18th century house with this insane chinoiserie plaster work. Um, and all this pretty much copied that basically from the, Im from the image in his head. He's so That's talented. Amazing. Yeah. And the, you know, that was like a Home Depot brown hollow core front door that just disappears uh, with all, all this is magic. Anyway, we gave up the apartment because Liza's in boarding school in England and I'm in England much more than I get to Palm Beach. Um, and the new um, tenant uh, in the apartment, it's a rental. It's, it's on Worth Avenue, it's above Moss and Hoffman. It's so glorious that it, it's breath, that the apartment is so breathtaking, you can't imagine, um, and quirky. And um, anyway, the new tenant, when she heard that I was gonna give it up, called me. She said, she's, in her, she's an elderly lady, um, a widow from Connecticut. And she said, I'm so excited that I'm taking over this flat that I couldn't sleep all weekend. <laughs> Charming, I was so, charmed by it it was so that adorable was really charming and i'm sure she would host you for a cocktail i think so we had to all this had to go back because you know when you're doing things um for yourself you don't you know you do them your own way so that we hadn't painted behind that cupboard but she <laughs> she didn't want the cupboard which we broke our heart because we weren't exactly sure how it was going to get out of the apartment yeah. so we got it out um and so he had to go back and tidy up the paint behind there at some point oh, that's hysterical yeah i love it no um, this is in a very different location, and yet there's also this kind of, um, although while very location appropriate, which I'll let you share where this is, there's also this, you know, this ease and nostalgia and even a little bit of whimsy that um, I think is just beautiful. So we, we got this, um, this request to go to Maine and to do this house on an island in Maine. It's on Great Cranberry Island, Little Cranberry Island, Great Cranberry Island. One of those cranberries. One of the cranberries. Um, <laughs> yeah, for a, a family with beautiful, young, beautiful family with young children. And the house had been owned by um, sort of like a, a, a really magical couple who had lived there for 40 years and who actually had a French chef and, and maids and butlers. And so they had very glamorous dinner parties in Maine, in the bush, on an island. Um, and so the house was very well known to people. And it had a really beautiful interior that was much more sort of like Colfax and Fowler or Sister mm -hmm. Parish from the 60s. Mm -hmm. And so our, our mandate was to sort of just update it a bit for the young um, family. They were in their, they're in their 30s with three little tiny children. Um, and, but to, to do it in a way that still was appropriate for Maine. So a lot of this stuff came from their attic and from Cherish. And, um, you know, we tried to be sure that we didn't do too much polish to it. Um, and that it was um, sort of um, still, you know, a, a language that, you know, Maine, that looks like Maine. Um, and so uh, I, I think we accomplished it. It was, um, it was pretty fun to do. And that beautiful painting over the fireplace was hers. Um, and, um, and I think, uh, I think we did it. Um, it was crazy. We went up to see the house in February. Um, in oh my Maine, goodness. And I don't even have the right, I don't even own clothes that can, like, like a like, coat. Or a hat. <laughs> we had to go across the bay in this frozen, um, frozen day with clear blue skies. I'll never forget it to see the house. And then we sort of just got on with it on paper and then went up there and installed it um, about four or five months later for this family. Beautiful house. Beautiful. Location. Really beautiful. You know, something that you can see it in the main house and here we're back in the Bahamas, but 
there's there's a kind of old world elegance that pervades a lot of your work. Um, even, you know, it sits very comfortably with this, you know, laid back tropical island air. And I'm wondering how you navigate or create that balance between two, what seem to be at, at first glance, very different things, a formality with a kind of casualness, but yet um, I think it's part of the brilliance of your work. Uh, well, that's very kind of you, Steele. Um, you know, as a creative one has never actually thinks they're brilliant, they think they're <laughs> Of course not. Uh, so I guess what I attempt to do, I mean, here's a good example. Um, the rugs that are down on the floor, which I love the picture. It the rugs don't even line up. They're so I know, they're, <laughs> love anyway, it. Um, whatever. Uh, maybe that's part of the charm. Um, it is. But the important. thing is, is that the rugs, those rugs are the cheapest, a dollar a square foot kind of rug, but they're sitting on top of that Venetian table. So I feel like if you've got something grand, you really need to knock the rest of it back. I mean, I, uh, I feel like this, the, 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 whatever the, um, the banquette that's against the wall underneath the um, mirror, I don't think it ever got upholstered. I think that's the muslin. So, I mean, wow. I feel like if, if you, you the, because the table and chairs are sort of a little bit high style, um, mm. the rest of it had to be a little bit basic um and you know the very basic ottoman fabric and cotton um and then the crazy um the slightly haphazard way we've hung the 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 pictures on the cabinet doors um and the oh, cabinet, yes, i love that the cabinet was too short um and i couldn't figure out how to fix it so i just put that policeman on the top to give it a bit of a <laughs> like a <laughs> or something yeah um i suppose i don't know i feel like it may be just a bit of bit of luck more than anything um, but the room is so pretty that just the shape of that room is so good that um, we can you kind of get away with a little bit of haphazard decorating, I think. The, the haphazardness, though, reflects a little bit of how we live these days, which is also, it's kind of nice to have that at home um, yes. organically. This, yeah. this room also has a lot of the um, highs and lows, but it also speaks to another point that I wanted to mention, which is rattan and your amazing love for vintage rattan and your eye for vintage rattan and of course your new collection which we'll also get to in a minute but um that in insanely gorgeous rattan sofa um, isn't just, that sofa it's, uh, isn't it crazy good oh it's so crazy good it's so good um so we have it in our on our hit list to sample to do one for our collection as well uh, it's sort of in process at the moment um so yeah, whenever I find these round ones, um, I sort of, I'm not supposed to hoard anymore because that's <laughs> bad, hoarding's bad. Um, but I do sometimes hoard these um, circular rattan sofas if I can find them um, and they're not too expensive. This happens to be a particularly good one, um, but uh, this is the living room of a house in Life or Key, so you couldn't get anything, I didn't want anything really crummy. Um, but this house was, this is the house of my daughter's godmother, um, the beloved Ashley, um, and um, she is particularly old fashioned. So, you know, we gave her um, a kind of crazy, um, uh, wonderful Lyford Key jazzy living room. Um, the, house had, the house had some quirkiness to it. If you can see the over door on the top right hand corner of that image has a kind of fake Robert Adamy thing going on. Yes. Um, so the only thing I could think of doing was just painting it black to get rid of it. Um, <laughs> I, I learned that from Miles Red. Um, is that that's a really that's a good trick. Um, and then yeah, just wallpapered and we put the, the the idea of putting that crazy coal and Sons wallpaper with the sh the peacocky fabric from Quadrille. Um, even I was like, is this gonna work? Is this gonna work? And it did. It looks kind of great. great. Yeah. Okay. And then she brought those bookcases from. Um, uh, her house in New York, and they fit beautifully on either side of that wonderful oil painting that we bought um, at Sotheby's or Christie's in New York. It's a, uh, there was a painter in the Bahamas called Frederick Solwadell who painted, he was an architect who painted on the side, and we all um, bid against each other at auction for these paintings. Uh, I love it. <laughs> because they're so charming. They, yeah, they, every once in a while you have to call someone and say, do you want it or do I want it? Because no one should, if we're going to bid against each other, you're my friend. <laughs> Let's just sort this out ahead of time. Exactly. Exactly. But we were fortunate. This is the back porch of that same house. This is one um, of my favorite rooms. You're so cute. And this is just a lot of, you know, I, I, you, you just collect a bunch of rattan and, 
and then paint it and carry on, right? I Put, love it. Get it for a drink, right? Get a leaf. Get a bit. I also love the idea of these huge, crazy mirrors wherever I can find them. That mirror is five feet across. It's so wonderful. Um, and um, and I think, uh, yeah, and then just paint, when it went in doubt, paint it all over muscle green, right? And someone's asking if you don't mind sharing that Benjamin Moore color again that's so close to muscle green. It's called Benjamin Moore Southfield Green. I don't know the number, but it's Southfield Green, and I think it's in the classics or the okay. whatever. Yeah. That sounds familiar. I know I've seen it before. Um, yeah. Here are a few pieces of your new collection, which are so fabulous. <sighs> Thank you, Steve, I mean, for sharing them. Thank you so no. much. Well, it's we amazing because it feels, they feel vintage and yet they're brand new, which is the best of both worlds, honestly. Well, they're all vintage inspired. Um, largely, we took um, pieces that I've loved from vintage that I sort of use and um, have found and then rescaled them and, and made our own way with them a bit. Um, this Pagoda Etagere, um, I found a vintage one that was very short and we used it in a project in Harbor Island. Uh, we painted it black um, and so we just took that um, that shape and then uh, made it our own and scaled it up and um, made it possible to stick a TV in it which you know everybody wants a TV somewhere uh, <laughs> and then crazy crazy bed. I'll tell you a funny story about the bed is that you know I, I'm sort of willful sometimes when I shouldn't be um, <laughs> and um, and I should listen more but oh, um, that is really extra tall because my theory was everyone's building um, in Florida in, along the, the South Carolina coast, they're building houses with very tall ceilings now. And so most four poster beds we, buy, we find in the marketplace are not tall enough. We often have to like add about six or 12 inches to the top to give, to give us the drama we want. So I made this one extra tall and it's exactly two to three inches too tall for every project I've tried to use it. <laughs> That's hilarious. I love it. Anyway, uh, so then maybe the next iteration will just shrink it by two to three inches. So I was gonna say it's just it's a prototype. We'll we'll yeah. Yeah. finesse it on the next go around. Yeah, when it's so it. dramatic. I very oh, this is so pretty. I was gonna say at the risk of accelerating you past that amazing rattan, I I would be remiss not to talk about your incredible tablescapes. It, it's like you know, there, it's almost like you know. There's an ease to your entertaining that I wonder if there's just something in the tropical air that makes it like, you have to know how to do that if you live in the Bahamas or something. Um, but your tablescapes, this photo, which has a great story, and then I, I wanted to get to this one as well because I think this is just one of the prettiest table settings I've ever seen. I wonder, you know, how, what do you, do you entertain often? I know COVID has made things a little different, but so tell me a little here's bit about the thing is, is that, I've lived in the islands for 30 years. And so we don't have a lot of restaurants and we, yeah. we do go to the Life or Key Club for dinner from time to time, but it's extraordinarily expensive. And to entertain the way we, we've all learned here in Life or to entertain in our homes um, in a way that's wonderful and relaxed and, um, and still has some formality to it, some history, like it, it feels like you were in the same way you would have entertained 25 years ago or 30 I years ago, 40 years ago or 50 years ago. So um, we set tables and, um, and we eat on this porch, you know, uh, 12 months a year. Um, and so um, we, we kind of, um, it's kind of our thing, if that makes sense. So um, exactly. and enjoy it. And the weird thing is, is that you just can't take anything too seriously. If, for example, you have 16 people for dinner and you forgot that you invited someone and they show up, slide two chairs in, don't let anybody know what happened, just <laughs> carry on. You just have to carry on with no matter what happens. And I'm totally guilty of that. Yeah. You have or to you, just invite, you invite 10 people and you think probably only six will be able to come or whatever, but then they all say yes and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, yeah. And, and, um, and it's always, I mean, it's always nice to have very good food. It's very nice, but it's so little about the food. It's so yeah. much more about the lighting. Like I, we, we talk a lot about that. Um, the setting that you create in your house with the doors open and the air going and the plants and the candlelight. I'm always talking about candlelight because candlelight is so flattering. Um, and to be sure that um, my best friend, John Fondas, 
um, is always coming to my house before my dinner parties and turning off lights and and being sure that it's perfectly lit. Um, he's obsessed with it and he's right. It's just I love critical. It. It's critical. It um, is critical. to be sure that um, that and coziness. Like for example, um, I have this theory that you should have eight people at a forty-eight inch table. Eight at forty-eight. It love keeps it. you so tight that you cannot have a bad time. You talk <laughs> this. Way this way you talk this way whereas when the tables get larger the dinner party has an entirely different dynamic because um, you yeah. can only if it gets if the table is too large you can only talk to the people right yes. next to you yes it's really um it's really tricky uh, and um and let's face it dinners are about gossip and dinners <laughs> are about flirtation and dinners are about joy and dinners are about being a teeny little bit tipsy and and feeling um sort of like uh, they're a magical time if you get them right, I think. Love that. Yeah. Love that. yeah. Um, I just want to mention these pagodas are incredible. <laughs> they're, they're, part, they're part of Amanda's new line as well. Thank you. They're so whimsical and fun. We're doing some wonderful, we have, we have some incredibly other charming things in that scale for the table for spring and summer of 21 as well. So really excited yeah. about that. And these, I love these hurricanes and that bar table, which... I think you also shot this bar table as a bedside table. And I thought that is so clever, not necessarily to keep drink next to your bed, although one could do that, but just the notion that these tables are so useful and multi-purpose. Yes, I mean, we made the apron on this nice and deep so that the, the liquor bottles aren't going to be the starring role of your, your living room. Because let's face it, um, alcohol is kind of a, it's sinister certainly in the morning. You don't want to be like, <laughs> Ta-da, here's my bar at eight in the morning. So um, they can hide a little bit in there. Oh, brilliant. It's also a wonderful night table. Um, it. Yeah, it's based on a table that we think, I bought them vintage, but I think they were made in the Dominican Republic. Because um, uh, I've seen them in, oddly, in images of um, Genevieve Four's house that was in AD, and one maybe in Oscar de la Renta's house. So Ooh. I'm guessing that there's a there's a, um, a rattan and wicker maker in the DR doing magical things. I'm guessing. That I love that. Um, okay, I want to make sure that we talk. We we're, I'm, we may not make it through all of our slides before I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. But I want to make sure that we talk about this room. Um, I had I developed a bunch of questions for you about working with clients, because I know that's important to this audience in particular. Um, and maybe the most important is, how do you know when a client, when you're a good fit for the client, or perhaps more importantly, when the client is a good fit for you? And I know this room is kind of near and dear to your heart. Yeah, this is the most, I, I don't know how to answer that question. I mean, that's just about human nature. Sometimes, um, uh, I, I mean, I'm, generally try to have very good manners in life <laughs> and so sometimes I have clients um, who can be tricky because I say oh, oh okay I'm you know the 30th thing I've suggested and they still don't like it and that can be sort of um, it can break your heart a little bit and so yeah. other like I've asked decorators who are more experienced like you know not you know like older decorators, how they do it. And they're like, oh, yeah, the client gets three choices and that's it after that, <laughs> nope, no more. So, and you know, I can be on like bed 35 and be like, okay, we'll what keep trying. <laughs> yeah, um, but, uh, but that's just, I don't know, maybe as I get older, I'll be better at that. I'm not sure. Um, I, 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 I tend to be trying to please, so. You're a pleaser. Um, so you, would... can, you, you can get down a rabbit hole where you're trying so hard that you're, you, by the way, when you, suggested something when you've done eight schemes or something you do kind of um you do sort of lose your your you're like okay well, what do you want and i right. will do that but right. it doesn't necessarily okay. reflect what you know my first three um schemes are, are my best three schemes i mean i have actually studied them and worked on them so <laughs> i don't know that's a, it's a tricky question um i mean i think we all have had clients that have been trying, um, but mostly I love my clients and um, I really do want to please them. I want their houses to look like what they want and want them to be happy um, because we'll all be happy um, together. So we do make a big effort. But this particular um, room is, you know, I, there are just things in life that are in your heart and these clients are just from heaven and magical and with the, the most incredibly 
beautiful intentions. They want us to thrive working with them and they deserve every, they deserve our best. And there's a very sweet story here. Um, the husband, uh, when we started this project, this is Maria de la Guardia and Teofilo Victoria. So of course the, the classicism in this room is perfect. You feel yeah. very good in this room. Um, and the husband said to me when we were first starting the, the project about four years ago, three and a half years ago, I can't remember. Um, if you come across anything special for my wife during this process that relates to the Bahamas, would you let me know? And I immediately said, um, you should buy antique sailors valentines for her and maybe some conch pearls. Anyway, which are these beautiful native pearls that grow in conchs, they're quite rare. Um, anyway, lo and behold, we found these valentines um, across, we found them in England and some in the States. We found about 25 of them um, and we proposed them to him thinking that he would choose one or two. And he said, okay, let's get those. And we got them all and we hid them in our office in Nassau um, for the duration of the construction, which was approximately two years, I think, I can't remember. And then we put them in the house during the install and she had no idea. She walked into the house and there was this incredible um, gift from her magical husband to her. Um, and it was really, I mean, it's really so, so sweet and nice. And um, everything about this project had that same, um, sort of magic to it because uh, they are very special. And the house is fantastic. And it happens to be at Baker's Bay. We finished the house um, in June of 19 and the hurricane smashed the house up a bit um, in the first of September, um, but not so, not so badly. It was, the house was so beautifully built that had some damage and they spent the summer there um, this summer. Oh, lucky uh, yeah. that. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna quickly take us, this. We'll, we'll come back to that if we have time, but I wanna, I wanna just nudge the audience to submit questions if you, um, if you have any. And while we wait for those questions to kind of collect, I wanna um, get us to our Tebow slide where I've asked Amanda to share her favorite selections from Tebow's fall launch. And she has chosen the New Haven Stripe and the Indian panel. And I have samples of those here that I'm gonna try to, I have to actually like hold them in front of me so that they don't get lost here. But um, I wondered if you could share, Amanda, your idea for how you might utilize these in a project. Well, I, I think Tebow did a great job, so I might just copy them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I really do love, I love both of these things and I love them together. Um, and I, you know, there's nothing more beautiful in life than a framed anything, everything okay. good with a border. Um, and so, I mean, I would love to use the Indian panel paper back it and use it as wall uh, wallpaper in some room. I feel like amazing. it's incredible, like an incredible foyer. Um, and that then, would be amazing. Yeah, so beautiful. So I'm intending to do that. Thank you, Tebow. Um, I think it's, I, I think it. this is beautiful. Super beautiful, both of them. I love the scale of the stripe too. And stripes, yes. of course, are, um, you know, I use a stripe in every room. I always use stripes. I um, love a stripe in every room. I couldn't yeah. agree more. Yeah, stripes just represent happiness, don't they? Like, fest they're festive. They There's a good energy to a stripe. Yeah, I agree. Okay, we have one question about um, the color of the walls on the, the color of the pink, I think it was a pink color on the walls in a living room, which yeah. I, can, I may try to go back to, but I, I don't know. It's kind of in the it's beginning, do you remember? You know, I don't know the number of that paint, and I'm not so sure that we didn't also fiddle with it on site to get it right. Right. Uh, it's like a, just a watermelon. It's going to be a Benjamin Moore, but okay. I'm not sure I know what that is. I could try to figure it out, but I have a gut feeling. I know we fiddled with it. Ha um, yeah. do you know the, the painter who's been all over the internet recently, Halle Hattabagay. She, oh, was, she was Mario Bawada's painter. Yes. Um, and so she's had a lot of fanfare this spring because of the Mario sale. Um, she painted that for us on site and I think we did fiddle with it a bit. Um, a bit. So it may have been, I mean, I'm not the gal who uses a lot of custom stuff. I'm Amanda. Amanda may have lost connection for a minute. Let's see, oh, you're back. I'm back, sorry about that. Okay, I was gonna, you froze for one second, but we got mostly through it. I was, I was thinking, if she freezes, we'll just look at her pretty pictures more. <laughs> Another question um, that's very sort of of the moment, but um, 
someone is asking, what do your dinner parties look like now during COVID? And do you have any recommendations for entertaining at this time? So um, I have only had a few and they are exactly as they were. I love but, it. <laughs> yeah. So we are in the Bahamas and we have had a very strict, our borders are closed. There are no commercial flights coming in. It's been that way since March. But there's a very tiny circle of friends that have all been seeing each other. And in the beginning of COVID, we got together at six o'clock at night and we played Trivial Pursuit and had these sort of quirky buffet dinners. Um, whereas normally we have these kind of sort of lovely organized, more, more sort of formal dinners. We had these kind of charming, um, everybody was, you know, I'll bring grapefruit juice, you bring the vodka. Does anyone have any, any of this? Because we weren't even allowed to shop very much. So it's wow. been, a, yeah, our prime minister is a physician. And so he's taken the whole thing incredibly seriously, largely because we don't even have any ICU beds here. So right. I mean, we have not none, but we have 25 of them. So if, a, if the thing got really out of control, the country would have a, a, quite a problem. And so um, in my opinion, he's done a great job. Some people think it's been too strict, but, um, uh, I don't know. Anyway, so uh, dinner party right this minute, I, I it would be more or less the same thing. We'd sit in the octagon, there'd be eight of us, and it would be pretty um, normal, but I'm only having people that I've seen for six months that haven't moved, and we have not moved, and we have no cases in the western part of, of uh, Nassau. Um, we've had none, so we're trying to all start to get back to normal. I don't know what that means. I'm as, con no. I am as confused as anyone. Um, yeah. and, um, and I long for it to get better. I mean, it's just, you know, um, we can't, I, I can't visit my daughter in England because of quarantining and blah, 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 blah. So, um, but at nor we'd probably have a normal dinner party. A normal well, party. I love that. This is a great question, um, for this audience. Any advice for new designers transitioning from the business or marketing world? Um, some, she's asking, or he or she is asking, is there something that you, um, wish you'd known earlier when you started your, your advice for a new designer? Oh, that's a good question. I, I, um, God, I wish I'd known so much. <laughs> the thing that's, I don't know, like I'm not financially, um, I, I can think the macro side is good. The micro side, I'm not that interested in. So to be sure that you have an, an exceptional either program for accounting or that you've got someone you can rely on, um, because being accountable and being having impeccable um, billing and records is the most important basic you can do. I think, and 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 I feel like that's um, really really important. The other thing I would do if you're coming out of marketing or a different career, you're not going to have the technical skills you need to do CAD and to do Revit and to do these things. So my biggest advice would be to hire someone with experience. If they don't have to have, sorry with training they can come out and be someone right out of school um, to do these things but there's a level of professionalism in our world that's really critical mm. um, and you can't really wing it i i did when i was uh, 20 years ago we, we we didn't i was just decorating yeah but i'm much happier now as an experienced um decorator that i go into my meetings with perfect presentations and with the with the, the 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 team that can actually you know work in CAD and work in these things um it really it's very 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 helpful so I mean I don't know if that's if that's I've just I've, I've just taken someone who wants to start in decorating and added two professional people to their team but um, <laughs> if you can get if you can if you have great taste and you think you're going to be an awesome decorator um having those two skills, technical and finance, um, will get you everywhere. Absolutely. I think, that, I think that makes a ton of sense and it's great advice. Mm -hmm. Amanda, you mentioned that working with patterns is a bit of a learned skill, mm -hmm. um, but what are, what are some ways that somebody can try to learn this skill um, when it comes to working with patterns? Um, I, I guess just, um, I guess just having like, okay, so get a big table and get lots of, lots of swatches and just start to work with it together. And the other thing you have to do in, in decorating um, is you have to study. You know, I, I feel like um, I, I studied images and looked at books and looked at Pinterest and looked at other decorators 
for four and five hours a day for 25 years. Do you know what I mean? And what's that, um, the guy who wrote the tipping point, whatever, he says that if you've- Oh, spent, Malcolm Gladwell? Yeah, I think if you've spent 10,000 hours on something, studying it, you're an expert. Then you know it. <laughs> spend 10,000 hours looking at, at the great decorators. Look at, yeah. look at Imogene Taylor. Look at, at all of the old ones. Look at El Elsa de Wolf. Look at Jean Sen. Go and look and study and study and study and study the greats of our moment. They're all out there. And Instagram has given us this incredible gift where I wake up in the morning and I get to look at all of these incredibly gifted designers, what they're seeing and what they're looking at. It's very critical. And what you can also find is that if you get in a rut, a creative rut, the way to get out of it is to study. You just get back, back to your books. So, and make sure that you, you post-it note your books. I mean, we have some books in our office that have 6,000 post-it notes in it because some great decorator is showing us how to do a pleat in a curtain or how I think the slip cover should be seamed or these things are all critical to how something looks. And, um, and the, the examples are right out there. You just have to study. Someone mentioned this yesterday in a panel. I think it was Alessandra Branca, but if anything, the COVID and quarantine has given us a little, a little less time on airplanes and maybe a little more time to study, which I think is great. I know I've been doing more studying. Steele, I find it fascinating. I thought I was the busiest girl in the universe, um, but I was on eight planes a month in 2008, oh. and that's not going to happen again, ever. Um, I actually have, I have like spare time. I'm like, wow, you're, you're, you're like slacking right there. <laughs> You know what I mean, like, uh, you, you're not going to watch that um, marathon of Below Deck. No. I love it. I love, yeah, turn off the Below Deck marathon. Although, maybe not. <laughs> That's amazing. That's yeah. Amazing. Well, I'm going to ask you um, one quick parting thought before I thank our sponsor again. But um, we, we have maybe time for one or two lightning round questions. And so I'll, I'll get to the ones I think are most important. But... What would you say no room is complete without, Amanda? Books. You need books. I mean, even, even, if, you don't, even if you don't read, try and fake that you do. You need books. Okay. There's such a great follow-up to my lightning round question that I'll ask this one. Do you, and this, to put you on the spot, do you have a favorite design book? Oh gosh, I'm on the spot. I know, I'm sorry. Or maybe a favorite I'm one. Gonna say, I'm going to say no because I will insult all my friends. True. If I, if True. I give you one. So I'm going to say no. Okay. But we have a stack of books literally in the office that are post-it noted to the moon because we that. refer to them all the time. I love that. That's so yeah. great. That's yeah. great. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for joining me today. As we've already noted, this was a long time coming. It was so fun. We could have gone on for another hour and I would have lo loved that, but we'll do that soon. Still, I... Love you. I'm so I grateful. You. I know. <laughs> Thank you to ADAC for hosting us. Thank you to the audience for joining us. And of course, thanks to Tebow for sponsoring our conversation today. Thank you, Tebow. Thank you, ADAC. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.